Well, technically, chemistry is the study of matter. But I prefer to see it as the study of change. Now, just, just think about this. Lung cancer, inoperable. My name is Walter Hartwell White. I live at 308 Negra Arroyo Lane, Albuquerque, New Mexico. You, uh, you want to cook crystal meth? It's easy money, till we catch you. You and, uh, and me. That's right. And judging from the things you and other folks have written about him, your dad must be quite a guy. Yeah, he is. He, he's the best. He's a great father, a great teacher. He knows, like, everything there is to know about chemistry. The methylamine keeps flowing no matter what. How much is enough? Would you say he's your hero? We are not ramping down. How big does this pile have to be? We're just getting started. Oh, yeah. Y yes, ma'am. Totally. M my dad is my hero. I've been living with cancer for the better part of a year. Right from the start, it's a death sentence. It's keep telling me well guess what every life comes with a death sentence what happened because this isn't you jesse you asked me if i was in the meth business or the money business neither i'm in the empire business it is growth then decay, then transformation. It is fascinating, really. Breaking Bad is a show that demonstrates the duality of life with a narrative in the vein of a modern tragedy, almost Greek in style. How high can you fly? And should you utilize your skills if your talent can be destructive to the world around you, even if it fulfills you or the ones you love? As the famous dictum uttered by Socrates proclaims, the unexamined life is not worth living. And that is the moral quandary of Walter White, a high school chemistry teacher plagued by humiliation who had the perfect life in front of him. But after being diagnosed with inoperable lung cancer, his starved ambition and ego consumed the most sinful, wretched, dark reflection of who he always was, casting off the fear that paralyzed him from taking action in the past into the unrelenting meth kingpin known as Heisenberg. Although they may look the same, they don't always behave the same. German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche mentions his disgust of wasted genius. But what is it to use one's genius? Walt has a deep sense of loathing and regrets that a genius like him led a mediocre life. And I feel why so many people empathized with Walt was because at the beginning of the series, that path of no return was either so unknown, nearly guaranteed to run into conflict, or had unintended negative connotations. Why run away? What did you feel you had to run from? It's like that old saying about Hollywood. It's not so much that it changes you, but that it reveals your true self. And I think, in my opinion, that's what happened to Walter White. It revealed his true self. There was kind of a monster underneath it all. Doctor, my wife is seven months pregnant with a baby we didn't intend. My 15-year-old son has cerebral palsy. I am an extremely overqualified high school chemistry teacher. I have watched all of my colleagues and friends surpass me in every way imaginable, and within 18 months, I will be dead. I really think he, there were elements, there was this, this overweening pride and ego that you see pretty much from the, the, big, you know, the first season on, and it hides underneath that, I think, some sort of really terrible low self-esteem, some sort of shattered, broken image of himself, and I, I think there was a monster residing within that, that if these certain uh, elements hadn't come to pass in just the right way, 
we would have never seen the, the monster would have never revealed himself. And you ask why I ran? But I think what made Walter White the person he became might have transpired way back from that. Past him being a high school chemistry teacher and even past his gray matter days. But to his childhood. I knew things about my father. I had a lot of information. It's because people would tell me these things. In truth, I only have one real actual memory of my father. My mother would take me to the hospital to visit him. There, lying on the bed, is my father. He's all twisted up. And he's looking right at me. But I can't even be sure that he knows who I am. But the only thing I could remember is him breathing this rattling sound, like if you were shaking an empty spray paint can, like there was nothing in him. Anyway. It's such a small moment, yet it tells us so much about this man and fills in the gaps that didn't necessarily feel out of place, but weren't really fleshed out. Childhood experiences shape the vast majority of people in innumerable ways. And after hearing about his upbringing, it became clear that this was the case for Walter as well. He distinctly remembers the smell of the hospital, all the people present, and what they were doing, and exactly how his father looked and sounded. And that's because this was a self-defining memory. Something that ultimately impacted him as a child and played a part in the way he lived his life up until his inevitable demise. That's why he remembers this experience so vividly, nearly 45 years later. There's a bottomless trauma there. And no matter how far in the past they might have occurred, these life-changing experiences can mold our psychology and ideologies, riddling our minds in excruciating detail. And aside from losing his father at such a young age, what cemented this memory was the manner of his death. Walt was petrified witnessing the unrecognizable husk that was his father, and it frankly disturbed him that this image of him twisted and crippled is what stuck with him the most. It's almost as if he felt like the lasting impact of a man can be established from a small, diminutive, incongruent recollection like seeing his father in that hospital bed. I don't want you to think of me the way I was last night. I don't want that to be the memory you have of me when I'm gone. We're all our own intimidating critics, and it's sometimes so different to find the merits that others see in us. We may be such wonderful people to others, but to us, only the blemishes stand out. Becoming so fixated on things that drive us to that edge and make us forget what's right in service of what we must do. I have spent my whole life scared frightened of things that could happen, might happen, might not happen. 50 years I spent like that. But you know what? Ever since my diagnosis, I sleep just fine. The capacity for evil and monstrous behavior is within all of us. Walt makes a series of decisions that cultivate and magnify those capabilities. Coupled with intelligence and resourcefulness, he finds great success while acting like a monster, which only further encourages him. And I think our connection to this character all boils down to Brian Cranston. We weren't just handed a performance of Brian playing a dark, manipulative drug lord. 
The mastery of his craft is how capable and subtle he can be in compartmentalizing different parts of his incredibly expressive facial gestures. It's what makes him both an outstanding dramatic and comedic actor. There's so many layers to Cranston's performance of Walter White. How he behaves with each character, how he carries his secrets, peddles lies, battles with himself internally and externally conveys emotion and changes throughout each season, each episode, each moment, showcasing Brian's acting ability while delivering the role of a lifetime. What happens is that we think that if you are vulnerable and sensitive and open, that you'll be ridiculed. But as adults, when we mature, what we realize is that if you have the audacity to display those human, honest emotions, that the opposite is what happens. People embrace someone who is in trouble, someone who is vulnerable, someone who is frightened. We, they, they have a tendency to come forward and put their emotional arms around you. So that once actors learn that, it's like, oh, the, the finger pointing is only by the uneducated and the immature. The, the ones who truly count, who ones who enjoy literature, and, and well-crafted storytelling are anything but that. They're open and, and uh, welcoming to that type of personality. And I think a massive examination of Walt's morality was the night Jane died. Something I find very interesting about Jane's death is that at that moment, Walt probably did think he could live with himself. However, it was only after we find out the immense guilt he's experiencing in the episode Fly. In this episode, a fly enters the lab and Walt tries to annihilate it. Jesse is confused as to why Walt is so fixated on the fly. And as the episode progresses, a drugged up Walter apologizes for her death and even almost revealing to Jesse that he was there. He only saw Jane as a chain around Jesse's leg, but when Jesse sobs in his arms, saying that he loved her more than anything while Jane's father becomes so distraught, accidentally colliding two planes together, killing hundreds, it's clear that Jane's life had more meaning than he initially thought. We see Walter at his most honest and vulnerable, his consciousness eating away at him. Ironically, Jesse is the one that manages to kill the fly in the end, symbolizing that he's finally moved on from her death. However, that same night, a fly buzzes around in Walt's bedroom, keeping him from sleeping, showing that he is genuinely unable to live with his actions. We as human beings are fully capable of a wide spectrum of emotions. I believe that if we chose the, the, the sweetest, meekest person, that person, given the right set of circumstances, can become dangerous. Heisenberg is the high and mighty of a man who once dug through the mud and dirt, and the moment he found something he became famous for, he clung to it directly mimicking actions that of a drug addict. You know, lacking any responsibility for his actions until after a detox or in varied moments of clarity. The mental gymnastics it took to justify his actions, always asking for one last hit every time he almost quit. The erratic behavior after outstanding successes, illusions of grandeur, paranoia, a total disregard for how his chasing that high might affect others. It's crazy to think that in the grand scheme of things, the degenerate low-life drug addict has a better moral consciousness than the ingenious scientist with a family. Jesse wasn't born gifted with Walt's intellect, but he works hard because he cares, even while constantly being told he's not good enough. On the other hand, Walter is a man whose sense of empowerment continues this egregious cycle of immorality. He was talented and wanted recognition, all within a situation that presented opportunities to climb the status hierarchy to maintain the drug-like euphoria. And if Walter White would have never been recognized as a force to be reckoned with, 
At least Heisenberg would. Say my name. You're the goddamn Iron Chef. A trained chemist. He's the devil. Goes by the name of Heisenberg. 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 You're goddamn right. Jesse refuses to continue that cycle, even though he is repeatedly punished for it. He innately cares about protecting the small, weak, innocent, and defenseless. He's a natural protector. And that's why doing the antithesis of that is the equivalent of a thorn under his skin. He's someone who started off looking at the world with childlike wonder, but lives in a world that preys on the vulnerable which makes him slowly erode away into a broken, hardened, and hopeless soul. Aaron Paul delivers a truly iconic performance by showing his vulnerability and ability to do good, yet showing the pain, rage, and darkness underneath it all. I'm very much an advocate of complex trauma and PTSD in fictional media, and I think Aaron's work as Jesse is an absolute standout in that category. A good example is that go-kart scene, where even when he's doing something that's supposed to be fun, you can tell he's so broken inside, screaming in outrage that not even this is pulling him out of a dark place. Now don't get me wrong, Jesse will fight back when it's justified. He will stand his ground and defend himself and those he's loyal to, because that is what a natural protector does. The thing is... If you just do stuff and nothing happens, what's it all mean? What's the point? Hi. How can I help you? All oh, right, this this whole thing is about self-acceptance. You don't have to do this. So no matter what I do, hooray for me because I'm a great guy. No matter how many dogs I kill, I just what, do an inventory and accept. When you're so broken down that your own thoughts are your enemies, it's terrifying. Because now, you want to do anything to drown that out than be alone. But the extremes of that method can ironically lead to self-destruction. The more layers that were revealed, you realize that he kind of, he has this heart. I mean, he kind of is this guy that you want to hold and protect, even mm -hmm. though he is a drug dealer and he is a murderer. Mm -hmm. But he likes kids and yeah. he's a, he wants to be a good guy, um, so you want to support him. I honestly don't think this show would have taken off the way it did without Jesse. It still shocks me to this day that Vince Gilligan was gonna kill off Jesse in the first season. From what I heard, Pinkman would have been the reason that drove Walter into the criminal world. I'm sorry, but I think this show would have been cancelled because I just couldn't imagine Walter's character having a lot of direction based on his development at that time. And also, by the end of the show, are you really rooting for anybody other than Jesse? Why would anyone paint a picture of a door over and over again, like, dozens of times? But it wasn't the same. Uh, yeah, it was. It was the same subject, but it was different every time. The light was different, her mood was different. She saw something new every time she painted it. When people talk about Walter's characterization, they often discuss a shift from Walter White to Heisenberg. We've all seen the meme, this is the moment Walter White became Heisenberg. And people tend to say it could be when he ordered a brutally wipe out 10 guys in prison, or poisoned a kid, or allowed a young woman to die of a drug overdose, or allowed his former partner to be tortured in cold blood and turned captive into a meth slave. Shortly before bragging about how he allowed his girlfriend to die whilst also cooking methamphetamine. You know, cause family. But because I get this question far more times than I can count, 
very few people, I presume. The moment I think Walter White became Heisenberg happened in the very first episode, actually. And that was when Skylar gave him veggie bacon in episode one. Good job, Skylar. That turkey bacon made him start his entire downfall. Being frugal was really worth it now. Just don't sing him a happy birthday, I beg of you. Happy birthday. No, okay, I'm just messing with you guys. As a matter of fact, the moment Walter White became Heisenberg is when he throws a pizza on the roof. All I'm gonna say is that Walt brought the dipping sticks, but Heisenberg threw the pizza. But all jokes aside, I think if I had to pinpoint which moment Walter White became Heisenberg, it would be relatively early on when Walt found out that he was in remission. Let me set the scene. The moment of truth arrives, and the entire family waits to hear about Walter's test results. And contrary to what Walt expects, these results become fantastic news. He's in remission, and his tumor has been reduced to 80%. And it's well worthy of celebration. And Walt's initial response is just that, in a highly emotional and heartwarming scene. Yet it dissolves his initial happiness until all left behind is an aimless sense of bewilderment and anger. When I first watched this scene, his outburst seemed very strange to me, compared to the more uplifting tone we had just witnessed prior. But after that shock dissipates, it becomes clear that this is the most appropriate reaction from a man like Walter White. Getting a death sentence enabled him to live like there was no tomorrow by navigating those unforeseeable avenues to providing for his family in his eventual absence. But that death sentence getting revoked hinders so much of that supposed irrelevance at that moment, and his ego can't stomach that. I am not in danger, Skylar. I am the danger. A guy opens his door and gets shot and you think that of me? No. I am the one who knocks. I've always thought of this infamous line as a man now free but dancing with fire and shadows in the hot desert sun to achieve something bigger than life. The knocking on the door could also represent a bad omen, as though he was warning that he's coming for anyone in his way, even family. When you're in that deep, you're not the one who knocks. You're the one answering the door. Skylar was never in the wrong. And sure, in hindsight, I completely understand why people hate this character. I did too. She essentially interrupted the power fantasy Walter and a lot of fans were tripping so hard on. But how about this? I'm gonna give you a hypothetical. Imagine your spouse starts lying to you for a couple of months and then you later find out they're a huge drug dealer or... Sorry, drug manufacturer, because that isn't as reprehensible. And you and your family's lives are in danger, and that your spouse was the one who knocks. You'd do whatever you could to protect your kids. She was a believable and dynamic supporting character. And she's telling him exactly what he's been learning from experience from the start of the show. But it's an attempt to get him out, not cement his status. I'm at some something of a crossroads. And it's brought me to a realization. This is not me. Because this isn't you. I am not a criminal. And that's what makes Ozymandias the best episode of television that I've ever witnessed because everything we thought would happen is paid off and shown in this episode. When you watch Breaking Bad a second time, the tone changes. You won't forget this episode. Not ever. Like a slow but explosive reaction waiting to happen and as soon as it erupts, 
Walt finally had to suffer the consequences. It's very symbolic of chemistry, a combustible creation of unfulfilled potential and ego, Heisenberg being the compound that's fed more and more harm to other people and the profit of Walter White being an element, and the diagnosis being the other. You expose an element to condition A and nothing happens, but if you expose the same element to condition B, it might produce a very violent reaction. And his family had to suffer for it. Hank may not be the definition of a hero, and he doesn't need to be morally perfect just because nobody can be. And much like modern superheroes, instead of the consequences being an obstacle to overcome and the reward being a fulfilling life, it's the reverse. Any amount of wins he gets don't outweigh the physical and psychological damage he endured. And the final reward he gets is... death. <laughs> Now, if you ever think Walt is one of the most villainous characters in television history, just remember that he offered $80 million in exchange for Hank's life, and Mr. Krabs sold SpongeBob's soul for 62 cents. But it was a tragedy dealt by his own hand. Something that specifically pertained to me as well in the show was the cinematography. As impeccable as it was, the wide shots particularly grabbed my attention. The emotional distance it creates accentuates something about the characters, and focusing on it would only play to voyeurism more than anything. But using wide shots allows the significant violence to be integral in the show, and goes to tell a great, impactful story. The Western ethos of the show is not just referring to the abundance of its desert visuals or its cowboys and lawmen plotlines, but it revolves more fundamentally around the show's feeling of living large, discovering what it truly means to be alive. But like an Ozymandias, the great statue fell, and now it's reduced to its granite state. Stay a little longer. Yeah, I got a long trip ahead of me. Two hours? I'll give you another $10,000. This episode sobers you up to the awful lingering aftermath that was Ozymandias. This reality sets in for Walt. This isn't a fever dream, this has become your life, and your empire business is gone for good. There's this term that goes around in literature called the metaphorical mask, and there are many reasons why people wear this metaphorical mask, but it's usually to conform to the charade of normalcy that we often perceive as conventionally sound. Happiness is so momentary and fleeting, and the moments you want to capture the same level of carefree bliss, you can't, because it's already happened in the heights of however you felt at that moment. Heisenberg may have been the ultimate personification of Walt's pride, but it was already rotting him from the inside long before the cancer did. And it was when watching Felina that I realized how Breaking Bad is undoubtedly the best show I had ever seen. Felina's willingness to explore doubtful righteousness in ways that are equal parts heartwarming, heartbreaking, and frightening remains unmatched to this day. Walt is doing what he can to make some right out of all this wrong. Now he has to muster the motivation from the embers of his old anger. The following proceedings occur with a wariness, like he's conjuring Heisenberg so he can do a job, not from any remaining hatred. Walt finally realized that he wasn't just Walter White and he wasn't just Heisenberg, he was both. American educator John Bradshaw once stated, I define a good person as somebody who is fully conscious of their own limitations. They know their strengths, but they also know their weaknesses. 
they know their shadow. In other words, they understand that there is no good without evil. Good and evil are really one. But we often break them up in our consciousness. We polarize them. Skylar. All the things that I did. You need to understand. I have to hear one more time that you did this for the family. I did it for me. I liked it. I was good at it. And I was really I was alive. The way Brian Cranston delivered those lines was so good it gave me goosebumps. Watching it for the first time had me speechless and made me rethink everything that happened in the show. It felt like such a huge relief for not only Skylar but the audience as well. Randomly it clicked and it was then that I finally realized he had stopped doing everything for his family long ago. Walter's moral philosophy is incredibly reminiscent of the infamous story of Fyodor Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. In this magical little fairy tale, the hero is depicted as a morally troubled man who decides to murder an older woman. He comes up with many different reasons as to why he might be doing this, for the good of his family, for the good of society, or because his faith gave him a sign. But he eventually confesses that he simply killed for himself and for himself alone. The character states, whether I was a louse like all the rest or a man, would I be able to step over or not? Would I dare to reach down and take it or not? Am I a trembling creature? Or do I have the right? While all that Walt sees is a coward and unambitious, those around him see a sweet, caring, intelligent, and loving man devoted to his family. But he wanted his family to remember him as a man in control who would do anything for his family, a provider. So a dominant, fearful, and insatiable drug lord consistently gratified yet unsatisfied with his ramping success. And on the contrary, Walt did get his wish, but it came with a heavy price. Do it. Say the words! Say you want this! Nothing happens until I hear you say it. I want this. I wanted to save this part by the end of the video because the relationship between Walter and Jesse is arguably the reason why television has never been the same. It's common for people to just write Walt off as, oh, he's just using Jesse. But I feel like it goes deeper than that. And I think the most evident example is when Jesse and Walt get into that colossal fight and he gets drunk and misses his son's birthday. Then, when Walt Jr. comes to check on him, all Walter can do is break down sobbing because he's so regretful of how he treated Jesse, instead of being present for his own son's birthday. Then, the biggest tell is that he calls Walt Jr. Jesse as he leaves the room. Even the idea of losing Jesse. Like when he finally does quit cooking with him for good, it's enough to send him into a complete rage, screaming at him like a lunatic and trying to bribe the poor guy with his own damn money. But one thing that stings the most is this inferiority he feels, that he's never been adequately respected by Walt. Jesse is an individual that needs warmth, guidance, and acknowledgement. 
and Wald could only provide that in small doses that were overpowered by the negatives and counteracted by coldness. But those small positive moments, though they were few and far between, did leave an impact. Walt helped Jesse mature into a man with a clear sense of responsibility and direction. But Walt also taught him things, how to be diligent, how to be professional, and how to grow up. We see in El Camino that after all the indecency he had to endure, Jesse learned Gus's ruthlessness, Mike's calmness, Saul's con tactics, and Walt's intelligence. Yes, Jesse before and after Walt is like night and day in terms of contentment, but through learning how to cook meth with Mr. White, Jesse retroactively learns how much this business wasn't for him. He discovered the type of life he wanted to live, and formed an almost sacred bond that he and Walt wouldn't be able to sever for better and for worse. And so this very telling and conflicting final look between the two was always going to be the most appropriate way to sum up this relationship. You, uh, you want to cook crystal meth? Outside, Walt and Jesse stare at one another. Jesse's first look is as if he's asking Walt, are you really going to let me go? Walt nods, assuring him that this is the end and maybe even spying a glimmer of respect. The final scene of him driving off in the El Camino, laughing yet crying and screaming, has always stuck with me because while Jesse was physically free, he's so emotionally destroyed he'll forever be haunted by the memories of his past. Somewhere in Alaska, there's a man residing as a carpenter by the name of Driscoll. Maybe a wife and two kids, perhaps a lifelong bachelor. He doesn't go out much, but people love his work. The occasional client think they've seen his face before, but they quickly dismiss it. Mr. Driscoll is kind and hardworking, yet displays an inner sadness, scars that will never truly heal. But at least now, he is free to live out the rest of his days in peace. And as Jesse drives away, Walt hobbles over to the lab like a contented dog at the feet of his master. And as he saunters along the equipment in an almost nostalgic reverence as police sirens wail in the distance, Walt takes a look at his reflection which is reminiscent to that warped image of himself when he was in remission. Already corrupted, changed, mutilated. Compared to now, being a lot clearer, as if he's come to terms with himself and his decisions, before dying on the floor while police swarm the building. We as an audience can see purely by the look on his face that Walt is satisfied, proud that once he knew he was dying, he decided to start living, biting the dust before he can see the inside of a jail cell, surrounded by his legacy. When I heard the learned astronomer, learned it, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. I tend to think of a story as great literature when it can be interpreted in many disparate, profound, cogent, yet equally valid ways. So there's no doubt in my mind that Breaking Bad is great literature, and history will remember it as such. Nothing will ever match the first time experiencing Breaking Bad. Vince Gilligan's ability to completely understand how human beings operate while knowing how to lay all the variables in between really cements his legacy as someone who will never be forgotten. Bravo, Vince. Uh, you just don't get those opportunities. It's, it is the greatest role I've ever had and probably ever will have. This is not meth. I am awake. <laughs> 